really kind of deposit some things in you. And I, I believe it's going to bless you. Um, for those that are watching this by way of social media, and I was just telling the, the congregation here um, that I was gone for three days, and it was the three days of relaxing. But we listen, we got, a, we got away from our regular duties, but we did not get away from God. And my, my, my daughter, uh, Sarah Kate, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, she actually headed up a devotional time every morning, and that's nothing new to them. They do this at their house. But part of our vacation was the whole family just sitting in the living room together, and, and we read scripture together, and we prayed together, and, and sometimes we, uh, we, we prayed around the room. All the kids prayed, and the adults prayed. Um, that's, not, that, that's not something out of the ordinary. When we go on vacation, everybody look at me. When you go on vacation, you don't ever go on vacation away from God. Right. Amen. You don't, you don't put God in the back burner and say, well, we're going to just have a good time, and you know, I'll get back to God when I get a chance. That, you don't do it that way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen? Yeah. So as I've been saying the past few weeks about faith, faith is not an event. It is a lifestyle. Being in the house of God should not be an event. It, it should be a lifestyle. Coming to church should not be an event. It should be a lifestyle. That is just what believers do. I try, to, I try to explain this to people so often. I've had people say, well, you know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I said, that's true. But I, I w I, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that you have to go to church to stay a Christian. <laughs> Hello? Why? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And we, and we need to associate with people like faith. So the, those, that, those that pull themselves away from the church and say, me and God, we're okay. The truth is you're dying and maybe you don't know it. And there will come a day that you're going to be so cold and indifferent to God and the things of God. And out of this house, I don't want that to happen. I want to challenge you all the time. You know, I want, I, I want you to provoke, I want to provoke you. Uh, tonight I want to uh, share a thought that I've entitled, uh, Coming Into His Presence. Coming into his presence. We're still going to talk, tie all this stuff in with faith. Because without faith is what? Impossible. impossible what? Please, yeah. It's impossible to please God. Okay. Faith will always get us into God's presence. Faith will keep you in God's presence. Let me just digress just for a moment, okay? And some of you, in your notes, you might want to write this down. You need to pay attention to the, to the deterrence. You need to pay attention to the obstacles. What's, 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 a, what's another a synonym for deterrent? Anybody, anybody got another, another one? St stumbling? What? Hazard? distractions, obstacles. Listen, you need to pay attention to the hazards. You need to pay attention to the distractions, okay? There's a ton of things trying to distract you. You're wondering, you really, you really want to know why you can't grow in God because you're so distracted. You don't, you don't stay focused on anything very long. I'm good, and all of a sudden my, something happened, and now my mind's over here. Yeah, exactly. Now my mind's over here. Now my mind's over here. Yeah, and, and we're struggling with our walk in Christ. Okay? Let me help you with something before we go on. You, there is never a distraction in the presence of God. Hello? Right. There, there are no hazards in the presence of God. There are no obstacles in the presence of God. We have to deal with the obstacles and the deterrence outside of God's presence. You can't be moody in the presence of God. How we doing? Oh, we done got real quiet here. 
You can't, you can't have a negative attitude in God's presence. That only happens to me when I've stepped out of God's presence. You know, I was, and, and a lot of this came from, uh, as I said, the three days that we spent, and we went to this little place in Madeira. Madeira is out in the middle of nowhere, but a beautiful home. And, and one of the warnings there was, beware of rattlesnakes. So you know where we stayed? In the house. Not because we were afraid, but you know what we did? We spent three days and we didn't deal with any other people <laughs> or snakes. The, listen, the only attitudes I had to deal with were those that were living in that house. When we are in God's presence, there's really no struggling. We struggle outside God's presence. So we need to be taught and trained how to live consistently in God's presence. I want us, I want you to start going into um, deeper into his manifest presence. Turn, turn your Bibles, and Pastor Shea should put it up here, but uh, Psalms 84, verses 1 through 4. And while you turn that, I, uh, I'll probably say it again on Sunday, but I, I, need, to, I need to apologize in, in my excitement on Sunday in preaching. I gave you, some, some of you knew it and some of you didn't, <laughs> but I gave you um, a scripture reference of Proverbs 50, 56, 4. There is no 56-4. Okay? And I, matter of fact, so as, soon, as soon as church was over, someone said, 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 said Pastor, you said something such a thing. And I said, I did? I had to go back to my notes. and show, I, I had that written in my notes. So I don't know where I got it from. So, you know, I, I was talking to someone tonight, and they said, I didn't worry about it, Pastor. I just showed you a little grace. <laughs> <laughs> so keep, keep showing me grace, okay? Uh, no, this, this, this is Psalms chapter 84 beginning in verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place. Come on, give me verse 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right, that's right. How amiable, because I told him this one. Uh, how amiable are the tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Three. Yea, the sparrow hath found her house, and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my king, and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, and they will be still <laughs> praising thee. Selah. Interesting passage that David was talking about. How amenable, how lovely is your dwelling place. This is why I want you to start training yourself to start staying in the presence of God. Because it is a lovely place. The presence of God is a lovely place. He says, my soul, you know, and we've talked about this before, the soul is the seat of reasoning, decision-making, understanding, thoughts. He says, my soul, my soul cries out. My, 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 my soul is just so excited. It just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm swooned. I, I just kind of faint in your presence. I cry out for the courts of God. I want to be where God is. We've got to train ourselves to come into God's presence. All the stuff that I'm teaching, I kind of wish I knew growing up, and I didn't. But I want you to know it. 
Train yourself to start coming into the presence of God. All the negative stuff that happens in my life never happens in God's presence. Only time it happens is when I'm out of God's presence. Everybody look at me. They can't make you mad in God's presence. You got to get out of God's presence for them to make you mad. You don't commit suicide in God's presence. You got to get out of God's presence to do that. COVID doesn't scare you in God's presence. But we get terrified out of God's presence. David said, My heart and my flesh even cries out. Not just for a God, because there's tons of gods. My flesh and and in my heart, it cries out for the living God. The living God, yes. Whom, he said to Peter, whom did they, they, whom did they say, say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then it talks about even the sparrow and the swallow. Interesting, why, you know, I'll, be, I'll show you how dumb I am. I thought swallows and, and sparrows were pretty much the same thing. They're not. They're, they're, they're two different birds. They, they, they are constructed differently. Okay? And the sparrow, I think it was the sparrow, when he flies, m most of what he eats, he flies and he picks up insects. That's a swallow. You want to see my rendition of a swallow? How's that? You want to see my rendition of a duck? Look out! You want to hear my rendition of a wife? <laughs> okay. Even the sparrow, even the sparrow finds a home and the, and the swallow a nest for her young. A place near your altar. Here's my question to you. We're going to move on. What does your altar look like? And I'm not, I'm not talking about just build, build, building a place with little idols. That's what I'm talking about. But where, where is the place that you consistently go, yes. that is my altar. That's my altar. When Isaac was traveling with his family in the book of Genesis, he was looking for a home for his family. Three things that he did. The Bible says that he dug a well. Well, he built a house. He dug a well. And he built an altar. And majority of believers, you love God, but you don't have a consistent place that you say, this is where I'm going to spend time and I'm going to meet God. It might be in your backyard. It might be on a mountaintop. It, may, it might be, it really, it might, it might be over, over the coast. But I'm talking about consistency. I'm not talking about hit and miss stuff. Because tonight I'm going to talk to you about your devotional life. See, so many Christians were struggling. We're struggling serving God. One, because we're not in God. Mm, come on. We're, we're around the things <laughs> of God. And we know we're saved because we give our life to Jesus, but I have not yet trained myself how to live, how to dwell. Everybody say dwell. dwell. How to dwell in the house of God. Psalm chapter 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place. And I did a whole teaching on that before. It's interesting. That word dwelleth it really comes from two words. Do well. He that do well in the house of God. And so many believers, we're not doing well in the house of God. We're doing well when everything goes well. We're doing well when things are good. We're doing well when people haven't upset you. 
But the moment it does, what do we do? We don't do well. But he that dwelleth in the secret shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty is at that place that I can say God is my shield, God is my power, my trust, my confidence is in him. So, the, so now I'm back. I, I, in your notes, I want you to put it in bold print, underline it, highlight it, and put for yourself, I must establish an altar for my life. And again, I'm not talking about little statues and monuments. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a place that you are really going to sit down and be broken in the presence of God. Something I worked with the past three days because, you know, you know, often I'm praying and, and I look around this room and, and everybody in this room here, everybody in this room here, your name is on my prayer list. You know, and I've, I've had it in, in a book and everything else, and I had to hear it. So I decided, as since I was just having some time alone with God, and I got up, and I got my phone, and under my notes, I just begin to rewrite all this kind of stuff. And I just got this whole list of people that are here, and people that are not here, and people who go something to other pastors and everything else, you know. Because, why am I doing that? Because I'm going to take that, and I, I do, I'm going to take that to the altar. I want to call your name I want to call your name before God at the altar. David said in Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of life. Interesting. You will show me the path of life. When we're in the presence of God, we're always on the right path. But when we're not in the presence of God, we get sidetracked. I wonder what's over here. I wonder what's over here. That's interesting. That's interesting. And what we, then, then we're off there. And it's not, we're not saved anymore. But we are not in close proximity with the Master. Are we doing all right tonight? Yes. Are we tired or am, am I doing some good teaching? I don't, I'm, I'm not here. You guys are he's kind of scaring me a little bit, you know. Uh, we're concentrating. Don't hurt yourself. Um, <laughs> Sixteen, eleven. You show me the path of life, which is talking about a journey. In your presence there is the fullness of joy. Wow. In God's presence, there's a fullness of joy. That means there's satisfaction and there's peace in God's presence. So when you're living, a, you're at a place in your life and you're sensing, I just don't have peace. It is because at that moment, not to, again, I'm not talking about your salvation, but at that moment, you are not in God's presence. Because in the presence of God, there is the fullness of joy. There's satisfaction and there's peace. Then he writes, <laughs> at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Mm -hmm. And the right hand is the place of authority. That's why Jesus went and sat at the right hand of the Father. And that's why the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places with him. So he has put us at the right hand of the Father. So therefore we are people of authority. And because we are people of authority, listen, at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Now it goes back to faith. Faith is always at the right hand of God. Faith always brings pleasure to God. So therefore when we are living in Christ and we're in close proximity to Christ, we start living our life in pleasure. Wow. Let's stop for a minute because I need to pray. Because somebody's not getting it. Lord, I, I, I know you orchestrated this word tonight. I know it was a good word. For now, it's good for me. 
that I, I'm tired of going out and coming in. I'm tired of you know having quote a good day and not and not a good day. I, I want all my days to be good and satisfying and rich in you. So train me, Lord, again how to stay in your divine presence. And I pray, God, over everyone in the sound of my voice, whether it's people in this room or people that's watching away on social media. I declare over them: if we can come in together and we can come into your divine presence, that we're going to start living a divine breakthrough. In the closing, Lord God, of, of, of this message tonight, I pray that people are going to say, wow, I got this. My life's going to be different. I'm choosing. I'm choosing to stay in the presence. In Jesus' name, man. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. In his presence is where every child of God should desire to be. Every child of God should desire to be in God's presence. This, saints, this is, this, this is not religious stuff. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, everybody say lifestyle. lifestyle. I'm talking about a lifestyle. This, 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 is just, this is just who we are. It's my lifestyle. You know, how come your world's not falling apart? I can't fall apart because I'm in Christ. I'm in, I'm in Christ. Yeah, but this is happening. Yeah, around me there's chaos and there's havoc. But I ch I've chosen not to bring those obstacles, those distractions, deterrents into God's presence. So I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to, with each one of us, let's check ourselves. No one needs to point fingers at anyone else. Let's check ourselves. The very moment that, that attitude or that thought or whatever comes in. I was, we just stop. No, you know what? This just, this just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into the presence of God. Everything has its place. I, I got Yvonne back here tonight, so I just want to tell you, and I've said this before, and I'm not being facetious at all. You changed my life. Because she came into our home, you know, and Dorothy, Dorothy keeps a wonderful house, but she didn't keep my closet. <laughs> you know, so one day I got to the point and I said, you know what, I've had enough. And you're more than welcome any day to come over and you're going to find out it's just as good, if not better, than when you left. Because, let me tell you something, everybody look at me. Because in God's presence, everything has its place. In God's presence, the Holy Spirit will cause you to get rid of the worthless things. And call it what it is. And everything has its place. A few times, because I have a place... All my empty hangers are supposed to go down here. And just in my haste, I just take my shirt off. And I kind of leave my empty hangers over here. And my wife says to me, you know, those hangers aren't where they were supposed to be. <laughs> and I know where they, where they belong. In the pr Everybody look at me. Your life is not going to fall apart in Christ. Amen. Your relationships are not going to fall apart in Christ. I don't go as far as to tell you, and I can back it up with scripture, your health will not fall apart in Christ. Yes. Amen. Because you will start putting all these things into order, and you'll quit making excuses. Oh my God. You'll quit making excuses for the demonic. <coughs> Boy, when I were talking the other day, we got to talk to people all the time, and they go, oh, you know, you know, you know, Pastor, but I'm just I'm I'm just spiritual. Yeah. Devils are spirits. <laughs> Hello? Oh. We've got to get ourselves in the presence of God. Now though those that are around me and close to me, you know, for example, Vic, and there's others here, even Pastor Chase, you know. I, I, I have no problem with saying to my brother, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing that. 
that's, that's, that's not the man of God that you, you're supposed to be. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not doing it because I'm judgmental. It's, it's, it's the fact that I, I want to hang out with him in God's presence. Amen. I want to have a party in God's presence. So we need to encourage and build up and edify one another. So I want all the children of God to get in God's presence. Okay, let me, let me I, I don't know, about seven things I'm going to give you. So how do we get there? How do we get into God's presence? I I'm I'm told you what we need to do, but okay, Pastor, how do, how, how do we get there? Number one, repentance. That is number one. Because nothing substantial is going to happen in your life until you truly repent. And repentance is not a word that comes out of your mouth. It is something that comes out of your spirit. It is, it is the self-emptying process. Repentance is that self-emptying process. I've got to get this stuff out of me. Why? Because it doesn't look like Jesus. That pornography does not look like Jesus. That alcoholism does not look like Jesus. Those vile words that come out of your mouth, they just don't look like Jesus. So it's repentance. Nothing is going to happen in my life or your life without repentance. Come on, someone say amen. Amen. Okay. You know, you, you, need to, you need to start calling the shots on yourself and then those people that are around you. You're not being harsh on them, but you just need to start telling people. We can't do that anymore. Because we want to be men and women of God. Okay? Number one is repentance. Number two is humility. <laughs> Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. David writes, he says, a broken and a contrite heart, God would not turn down. God is not going to walk away from it. And I tell you what I've learned in the body of Christ. There's a whole lot of arrogance in the body of Christ. You know, I'm, I'm more saved than you are. <laughs> no, you're not. <coughs> <coughs> Ain't nobody here more saved than anyone else. Either, either you're saved or you're not saved. Hello? Yeah. So we grow. We grow in this process. Okay. Oh, Pastor, but I, I've, been ser I've been serving God for X amount of years. So it comes to humility. Someone said, Pastor, but, you know, I've been, I've been in the way 30 years. That's the problem. You need to get out of the way. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Let me tell you something. See, God's looking for humility. And God is so cool with this. God says, watch this. Humble yourself before I have to humble you. What I found out about the, about the things of God, when I humble myself in the presence of God, <laughs> wow, there's grace. Yes. It's easy. <laughs> when God has to humble me, God will take my sin sometime and shout it from the rooftops. So we start looking at ourselves and say, you know what, I, I need to deal with this. Why? Because humility is, is, is what's going to bring me into God's presence. Number three, you need, you need to desire. Everybody say desire. desire. You need des to desire to be in the presence of God. That's where I want to be. Not, not, not just where I need to be. That's where I want to be. I want to be there.
that I want God more than life itself. If I really don't, if I don't get into God's presence, it feels like I'm going to die. I told you the story of a young man that had traveled the world trying to find God and they said that he looked into Hare Krishna and Rosicrucian and, and, and Mormons and Jehovah Witness and, and, he, and he, he went to the monks and he, he went, he trying to find God, trying to find God. And one day he's walking down the dark road in the south and some real old black man was leaning up against a tree with a straw hat on and a twig in his mouth. He came towards the man and the young man said to him, said, Sir, I'm trying to find God. The man said, that's no problem. I can help you. Are you serious? I've looked all over the world. I can help you. So he finally stood up, and he took the boy's hand, and he walked out to the lake. And the water came up to his knees, up to his waist, and pretty soon the, wa the, the waves were up, uh, up, up to his chest. I mean, not the waves, the, the, the water was up to his chest. And he put his hands on the, on the boy and pushed him down. Just, and, you know, and the boy's like struggling for life. And he, and he, he comes out of the water, he goes, you must be crazy. Why would you do that? He said, young man, what did you want more than anything else in the world? He said, I wanted to breathe. When you want God that bad, you will find him. That's the problem with the church. We've created a, we really, we've created a false environment that, that's, a, that's, that's appeasing us, but yet we don't have this deep desire crying out, I want to know God. I really want to know God. I want to know everything about God. I want my life. Nothing else matters except me knowing God. Yes. You, you want to come to this prayer? You've got to have a desire to want to know God. I could have had a good excuse why not to come back here tonight. I could have come back tomorrow. You guys have been okay with me being, matter of fact, if someone else else come up, you guys would have been okay for me to go on all week and meet you back on Sunday. Yeah. But I had desire. Yes. I had desire to want to be here. Last Wednesday was our anniversary. Remember that? We had a wonderful excuse. We could have been gone all day long, didn't have to come back. And you guys would say, oh, Pastor, I'm glad you had a good anniversary. You know, and we spent the day over the coast and came back. But matter of fact, it was Pastor Dorothy that said, no, well, let's go back so we can be in church on Wednesday night. Yes. There is going to come a time that we are going to take some time off. But we just had a desire to want to be here. You want God's presence? You gotta have a desire. That's what I want. Number five. Number four. I was gonna give you number five first, and then I was gonna go back to the four, but that's okay. I'll give you number four. No, I'll give you number four. You wanna come in God's presence? Stay in the word. Become word people. I can I can almost guarantee you. People in this room, if you, you, you've been at church on Sunday, but you didn't crack this thing open one time since Sunday. Then you'll say, oh, Pastor, I use my phone. Okay. I almost can guarantee that you didn't crack your phone open one time since Sunday. But yet you want to say, I'm in God's presence. Yeah, come on. Listen, this is the manual. Hey. We talk about it Sunday. This is the manual for God's presence. You got to read the manual, not just any manual. You got to read God's manual. Stay in the word. Let God's word be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Let God's word be the logos, and then it turns into the rhema as the living word of God so, <clears throat> so you can serve the living God. Stay in the word. So here's my question I told you I was going to ask you. What is your personal devotional life like? Do you have one? And I'm not talking I, I'm not talking about do you pray? Because every once in a while all of us kind of shoot something up, shoot something up to the Lord, you know. 
That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a daily time that you spend with God. I mean, making an appointment time that you don't let anybody interfere with it. I've called over the years, I've called Melly a few times or texted her, and she didn't respond. And I wanted to know why. <laughs> she said, because I was spending time with God. Amen. And she called me back later. So I'm, not, so I'm understanding now that in a lot of her morning hours, I don't want to bug her. Because that is her appointment time with God. So my question, do you have an appointment time with God? Yes, you got to get one and keep it. Some people here, you're not owls. You have no problem standing up till midnight, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But I'm a morning person. My, my, my creative juices flow early in the morning. God gives me uh, inventions and ideas early in the morning. God gives me sermons early in the morning. I, I stopped, got up in the middle of the night and wrote some things down because I wanted to go back to sleep. And, you know, that, that's when God does stuff with me. So that's the time that I build my altar and I spend that quality time. That's my yeah. devotional time. Yeah. Everybody in here, you need to set a devotional time with God, and, and it's okay to tell your spouse or wh whoever, listen, don't bother me during this period of time. You know, I, 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 you know, this is nothing new, but I told you about Susanna Wesley. You know, she had somewhere between 17, I've heard 17 kids, 19 kids, I've heard 18 kids. She had a bunch of them, okay? But what she trained her children was this, that whenever you see mama, she pulls her apron up over her head. You don't talk to me. You don't bother me. Because I'm in a conversation with God. Yes. Okay. And out of that, we got Charles Wesley and John Wesley. Two young men that changed the nations. <laughs> yes, I'm challenging you. You know, you're never going to grow in Christ until you train yourself. to daily come into the presence, even if you're on vacation. Yes. Hello? My wife and I years ago went on a, on a little short cruise, and they'd been busy throughout the week, and, and I, I, I'd get up early. And then the cruise, we had an inside cabin, so we didn't have a window. So when that door is closed, it could be, it could be 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but it's pitch black in this room. So we went to bed at a normal hour, and, and our plans were to get up and go to church, on, on, on the ship. Yeah, we go to church on the ship. Sorry, that's what we do. But I think church started at 7 or early in the morning. And I woke up and Dorothy was sitting next to me reading. And she said, I bet you know what time it is. What, 7? I said, guess again. 8? Guess again. You're kidding. 9? Guess again. Ten. Guess again. It was after ten. Wow. Okay. My, 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 my body was demanding rest. Okay. But that's not my forte. That's not what I do. I get up early. But whatever. But, but Dorothy said, I know you needed your sleep, so I didn't want to bother you. Okay. See, she's different than me. She tried to sleep. I just turned the lights on and I just... <laughs> Stay in, stay in the word. Yes. Okay. Number five. Stay in prayer. Learn how to pray. Quit telling God what you want. Quit giving God a shopping list. You need to speak and you need to listen. Because God will speak to you. It might, be, it might be audible. It might be an impression in your spirit. It might be a prophetic word that you've got to write down. But God will speak to you. 
because Jesus lived a life of prayer, he never really had to go pray about it. But he just did it. Matter of fact, the Jews understood the hour of prayer. The Muslims, as well as the, as well as the Hasidic Jews, when it's time to pray, they pray. I've been on airplanes, and at a certain time, these guys got, got up and put their rugs on the thing there, and they bowed down and prayed. They didn't care who looked at them. They didn't care what people thought. But they prayed. And some of you were embarrassed to give thanks at the table for lunch. Stay in that spirit of prayer. Tell you something. It is so easy to pray when you are in the presence of God. Yes. Prayer becomes a struggle outside the presence of God. So we train ourselves to stay in the presence of God. When you stand in the presence of God, you know what happens? You enter into agreement with God. Yes. Why? Because you're in His presence. Things happen. So we hear and we listen to the voice of God. What is God saying? Matter of fact, some of you here, God really has already spoken to you regarding some situation going on in your life and your family and your relationships, but you didn't hear them because you're, you're, you're too busy. God wants to bring you back so you can hear his, hear his voice. Number six. You want to stay in the presence of God? Stay in fellowship with God's people. Stay in fellowship with God's people. Why? Because you guys can speak the same language. I understand that. They're talking faith. I understand that. Stay in fellowship. Get rid of the revolving door. In and out, in and out, in and out. No. Get in and stay in. Stay in fellowship. I know so many, so many Christians, just because someone said something they didn't like, they got out of fellowship. Then they say, I didn't get out of fellowship with God. I just got out of fellowship with people. I'm going to tell you something. Majority of the time, you walked away from them because you walked away from God. Because God would have settled a lot of this in his Amen. presence. Matter of fact, here's what the scripture says. Before you bring your gift to God, you go to your brother and settle that mess. Then come back. And what do you do? And put your gift at the altar. Hallelujah. Stay in fellowship. Number seven. Stay in covenant with God. Stay in covenant with God. Covenant is a very strong word. It's different than a contract as we know it. A covenant is eternal. David and Jonathan had a covenant. God calls the covenant he made with Israel an everlasting covenant. That even though Israel messed up so many times, God never broke covenant. We got to learn how to be covenant keepers, not covenant breakers. And that happens as we stand in the presence of God and understand that eternity lives within our heart. Okay? Eternity is the presence of God. Let me show you something. Give me that rope, please, sir. I still want you to help me here. Okay. 
just take that and walk it out. The Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. She walked it all the way out. Matter of fact, why don't you take it over towards my office door? You may have to come back down the other side. I don't know. This is going to help you. See how long the rope is? Okay. Of course, there's a limitation there. That's not eternity, but just for the sake of explaining this. God has put eternity in your heart. Okay? I guarantee you all this is definitely the presence of God. This right here, this is called life. We let this become a deterrent, a distraction, an obstacle, a hazard to interrupt eternity. I love God, but they don't like me. They offended me. They sang too many songs at church. They, the music is just entirely too loud. Oh, we find a million things to interfere with this. I'm going to tell you something. What we don't understand, underneath this tape here, is eternity. Your life that you're going through right now, eternity is still inside of you. Quit living by outward circumstances and live by the inward direction of the Spirit of the living God. I can't live my life this way anymore uh, because this does not satisfy God because huh, my eternity is at stake. This rope has a limitation. But you know how far eternity is for God? It just goes on and on. And on. And on. I remember as a kid looking up at a blue sky and someone trying to explain to me that that just goes on forever. Let's be honest. And that's, that's dumb. That don't make any sense. Nothing goes on forever. Well, that's not true. God does. And the God that's inside of you is a forever God. And his forgiveness is forever. Quit beating yourself. I said this on Sunday. Quit beating yourself up. Quit talking about your past. Quit focusing on your past, hoping to see your future. It doesn't work. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Wow. He's creating a fresh path of life. Your today is ready. It's at stake. It's interesting what it says about Peter and John. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13. And if there's anything that we need in 2021, it says, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took knowledge that those men had been with Jesus. They took knowledge that those men had been with Jesus. That's where your strength's going to come from. It's in Christ.
Sin doesn't sit well in the presence of the Father. There's no guilt, there's no condemnation, but I, get, I, I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is still going to get way under our skin and say, this is, <coughs> this is your day to get rid of the sin issue. And God wants you free. Amen? Amen. Did you receive tonight? Amen. Good Praise God. Come on, let's stand together. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will take the words that were spoken. And God, you'll begin to etch that in our hearts. God, I'm only here, Lord God, as a coach. I'm here as a shepherd. Lord, I want to build up a body of strong people that are saying, no, I am not going to vacillate in my walk, that, I, that I'm going to hear the voice of God, and I'm just going to obey. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to call this good. I'm going to call this bad. I'm going to get rid of stuff. I'm going to bring in new stuff. I'm going to clean out my spiritual closet. I'm going to get rid of uh, that which is, is, is unnecessary so I can make room for that which is holy. God, so I speak a blessing, Lord God, over every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place now in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. We honor you. Lord, I pray you we're going to find ourselves between now and Sunday. One, I'm asking, Lord, those on the sound of my voice, that they are going to open up their Bible and they're going to just start to read and, and, and uh, methodically read through Scripture. That they are going to build an altar time. This is going to be my time, my appointment time with God. And I'm going to keep that time. God, if someone here, they don't really know how to do that, it's okay. Give me a call. Let me give them some ideas. Let me help. But I want them to be established in faith. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Tomorrow morning, 8.30.